Because bad things happen to everyone. And it's hard to keep being yourself after they do. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 114 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. We got another big one on our hands, folks. We got Walking Dead Season 1 with Ryan Benno, one of the game's environment artists. He also works at a certain company you might recognize. It's called Insomniac Games. He worked on Spider-Man for the PS4, and he's going to be answering a lot of the questions that we have this week. Also, the camera was contributed by IDK31. Sir, thank you so much. I think so many people are going to be so thankful that you did this. And to you, my faithful viewer, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you slap a like and leave a comment. Also, watch it in full screen if you can. It all helps make sure that there's some interest so that we can then move forward on Season 2. But anyways, with all that out of the way, let's get started. Alright, let's start the episode with the start of the game. As many of you already know, you are in the back of a police cruiser heading down the highway towards prison, and with only one exception, the camera is focused inside of the vehicle at all times. Now, the first thing I notice, and it's the first thing I want to show you, is that you may recall being able to see the reflection of the officer in the rear view mirror. Well, video games love to do all sorts of different tricks in order to do reflections, but how it's pulled off in The Walking Dead is a little outside of the ordinary. As you can see here, there is a second model for the police officer, and the environment is a cone. A cone that has special textures that loop through the cone. And so anytime you look at the cruiser from an angle that's outside of it, this is what you're going to see. This is probably also why you never get to see the camera angle outside of the cruiser. Meanwhile, I'm sure a lot of you want to know what the city looks like off in the background. Taking the camera over there shows that it's all 2D textures. Now there's different layers to the 2D textures, but there are no 3D models here. There are 3D models for the houses, and there's also 3D models for the oncoming traffic. In fact, the vehicles in the oncoming traffic, despite the fact having opaque windows, have fully modeled interiors as well. Now the reason why the windows are probably opaque is because there's no drivers in the driver's seat. And I am sure that the developers didn't want to add that distraction to the player's experience. Now a humongous viewer request, which by the way, you can always follow me on Twitter. It gives you a heads up about what's the next episode going to be, as well as giving you the opportunity to see whatever you'd like in whatever episode I cover. That request I'm referring to is what does it look like when the police cruiser is flipping and tumbling? from outside of the cruiser since the camera still stays within the vehicle at all times. Well, you will be incredibly satisfied with what the result is, which is that the cruiser genuinely does tumble and flip through the normal environment. There's pretty much no fabrication here. It just looks kind of silly from the outside, that's all. And then once the police cruiser is crashed, we have ourselves here one of many first person moments. Now, it's really, really peculiar because I will tell you this, most of the time they do a very common technique with first person scenarios in video games, which is that the character loses their head. You would see this throughout the entire adventure of Resident Evil 7. However, in this one scene that I can recall, they did something a little bit differently. They decided to just pull back Lee's head, stretching his neck a bit in order to give a nice clear space for the camera so it didn't clip into the character model. This technique is a little less common I have seen it in previous episodes like Kingdom Hearts 2 with Sora, but the developers must have thought to themselves that this is also not a very effective idea because like I said later on in this episode you're going to see that there is a missing head throughout most of the season. And then you may also remember the scene where Clementine sees Lee and then runs back to the treehouse. Wanted to show you what it looks like when she's trying to run back and as you're going to see here she only gets a certain amount of distance that allows herself to get off camera and then disappears. And inside of the treehouse itself there is no environments. In fact, while the texture for the treehouse is on both sides to allow an empty interior to the treehouse, you'll also see that tree leaves are also bleeding into the environment, further proving that there was never an intention to really show the player inside of the treehouse. And towards the end of episode one, you might remember this character. Now, considering the fact that most characters aren't queued up and just standing behind certain things quite like this, it's really, really unusual to see the character just standing there waiting for the player to come up to the door. Also, we get a good look of the room that she's held up inside of, which looks really, really dingy. Now, funny thing too is that when you activate the cutscene where you finally talk to her, she does disappear for a little bit until the door starts to open. So for her to be standing there before the cutscene triggers is again, adding to the unusual nature of it. 
and I'm just going to take the camera around various places in Clementine's neighborhood just to give you guys more perspectives than you ever got in the original game. And while I do that, I'm going to have Ryan tell you a pretty interesting story that doesn't really fit into any questions that I have with the episode, but I still thought was very interesting to share with all of you. So in general, the way we actually built a lot of our environments is a little unusual from maybe what you typically hear from game developers after having a level editor uh, you know, when you kind of place an asset, right, you might put like a chair or a wall into a scene. Uh, that's not how we worked at Telltale. The way we built environments in Telltale was entirely in Autodesk Maya, which is one of the more well-known 3D packages that people use in the industry. Uh, it's, it's on par with like 3ds max or blender and we just built everything in there we did all our lighting we you know we would texture map everything in there and then we'd just export the entire scene as one large environment and then we would bring that into uh, the telltale tool which is the engine that they used there is so anytime we wanted to move something readjust the lighting or anything we had to basically move it in maya and then re-export the entire thing um, which was a little bit of a cumbersome process to iterate and change things on, but it was just kind of the way that we worked back in uh, 2011, 2012. Now, it might seem like I'm skipping ahead episodes very quickly. Just so you know, there's not a whole lot to find outside the boundaries in most of these episodes. I mean, there are things to see, but it's pretty consistent across the board, and so showing them off each individual episode would just be kind of redundant. So I'm actually gonna lump them together here Here's a whole bunch of characters who are off screen who have their eyes rolled into the back of their skull, which I've been told the reason for that is because that is the default position for the character model's rig. But I will add to what is off camera most of the time in these scenes and verify the fact that these characters are typically not in weird poses, nor do they have weird positions. Although in highly cinematic scenes like this one here, you can see that characters just bounce around all over the place while the camera is shifting from spot to spot. Another thing you'll find treasure troves of is T-poses. You got T-posing main characters, T-posing zombies, T-posing zombie hordes. And in fact, this one's particularly great. You get to see them all go from T-poses to lumbering zombies. It's, it's fantastic. But since we're going to move on to episode two, I figured this would be a good time to show you the transitional episodes in the main menu. But once you're choosing between episodes one through five, oh man. There's a lot of wackiness going on outside the boundaries. What you're seeing here is characters preloaded for whichever direction you decide to go with the next episode or the previous episode. And so all the characters that are out of bounds will be used in another episode. And it culminates all the things that we saw in this segment, like the rolled up eyes, as well as a couple of T-poses. And now we're going to take a look at a segment that I haven't talked about in a long time, birds. In this scene here, Lee is supposed to hunt down a bird so that the camp can have something to eat. Now what's very unusual about this bird is that if you take the camera right up to its face, you'll see that it has a human-like eyeball. A very not bird-like eyeball at least, that's all I can say. And then I wanted to give you a close-up of some of the bandits, they oftentimes just keep these guys well outside the player's view, so you don't get a great look at them. But here you go, you can see that this guy over here with the sunglasses has his own set of eyes, they are hazel. And this gentleman over here has some crude language on his shirt. So I'm just gonna let you read that one out loud yourself. And here's a separate environment for when the fellas are walking along the fence, helping to remove some zombies off of it. And you might remember there's some long dialogue scenes where they're just walking along the fence, and you might imagine to yourself, how far does this thing go? Well, the truth is that the characters will only walk a certain distance before warping back to another position, seamlessly transitioning for the player and making them assume that they're making some sort of distance here when in fact they aren't. And then the bandits attack. Now you might remember there's an arrow that gets fired off screen. And I kind of just wanted to see where that arrow came from. So if we slow down the footage and look at it from a completely different angle, you can see where the arrow is loaded in. And then from that position moves into the cinematic camera angle. Also, here's a close-up of the bandits. They darken the models so that you can't really see them that well. However, they're reused models from the ones that you saw earlier as well as a new guy with a goatee. And then there was a lot of people that wanted to know if Mark was always in that bathroom at all times. And I can tell you right now, the answer is no. I'll show you both cases in which he's warped in, including when he's warped into the bathroom, as well as when he's warped into the hallway for that really, really unsettling scene. 
And then underneath the dinner scene, it looks like there's some unused meat here. I did pinpoint the moment in which it disappears from the scene, and by that I mean it typically is called into the game. However, I looked at all the characters' plates before and after, and none of them changed in any sort of significant way, and certainly none of them ended up looking like the shapes that these two slabs of meat looked like when they were underneath the stage. Then pretty much the rest of this episode are a bunch of things that fans wanted to know on Twitter. Again, probably the second largest request was for Larry, and they wanted to know how the character model is handled when the salt block drops. If you take the camera underneath the stage, you can see the separate model that gets swapped out with the original Larry, as well as all of his pocketed items. But as you're going to see in this clip here, you can see the exact moment in which the character model is swapped in for the Larry model that you see just before the cutaway. Then you have the scene where Clementine goes into the vent, and you'll see very, very quickly she disappears. And that's okay, we just move the camera around and see where she went off to, and you will discover she's pretty much just outside the door, queued up and ready to go for when she comes through it for the cinematic cutscene. Are you okay? Did anyone see you? And this is pretty funny too. In this scene when you're sneaking through the barn, there are multiple instances in which the gun Charlotte is needed. It's the same model for that one gun. You'll find at least three versions of it hidden throughout the map, as well as a bear trap. And surprise, we got another developer off of season one to explain why this is. Hey, it's me, Nick Herman. I worked on The Walking Dead season one. I was director of episode four. So yeah, like you mentioned that you found, you know, multiple copies of a rifle at uh, World Origin. Basically, the reason there are multiple versions of one prop, um, so a rifle or a whatever, a candelabra or whatever, basically the way like handoffs and anytime an object is thrown or dropped or picked up or, or handed from one character to another, um, the way that that was handled primarily was through visibility of attachments. So you have a version of a gun that's attached to someone's hand, and then you have a version that is just attached to the world, so basically attached to nothing. And as he reaches down to the ground to pick it up, we make the gun that's attached to the world invisible, and then in the same frame we make the gun attached to his hand visible. And so we're basically, it, to most viewers, it just looks like um, the gun is being picked up, but in reality it's two different guns. Um, and, and that was handled that way for a while just because it was kind of the simplest way to do it. Also, you can manage the states of things a lot easier. You can, through logic, you can set the visibility of things almost as to like bulletproof it and make sure that later down the line something um, doesn't just, there's not a floating gun. And as we went on into sort of further seasons of The Walking Dead and, and into other projects, we ended up being able to animate um, attachments. So this was kind of... For, for The Walking Dead Season 1, it was all handled sort of really old school with visibility. And then you might remember this scene where Brenda holds someone captive, but before she does that, she sees you through the screen door. And I just wanted to show you really quick what the character model does to prepare itself from moving backwards to holding Katya. And because it's out of the player's view, there's no need for it to be graceful. And now we're moving on to episode three, and during the scene when the bandits attack the motel, you can find a lot of stuff stored underneath the map. The first thing you're gonna notice is a ton of guns. It's because they're used throughout multiple characters, as well as multiple instances when one character will use a gun. And then you'll see a T-posing bandit underneath the stage as well. And it looks like he has a big black beard, but the truth is that is not a beard. That is in fact a zombie skull. It's pretty evident when you take a good close look at what that quote unquote beard is, but then when you also look underneath his hands, you can see the T-pose of the zombie as well. And then just before you're introduced to the bandits, three of the bandits that get used are in T-poses side by side with one another. And then you might remember that Lily escapes out the back so that she can use the sniper rifle. Well, this is what it looks like from another angle when she hops on the other side. As you can see, she pretty much just gets trapped in the void. And now here's the highway scene inside of a camper. You'll find that the camper is not modeled on the outside, which makes sense because it's supposed to be primarily an indoor scene. And the highway itself uses the same trick that we saw earlier, where the map is divided into chunks. And once that chunk reaches the end of the animation cycle, it gets relocated at the front of the environment, simulating an endless loop. And here for the first time in the season, we have a zombie mob that is too big to have them all rendered in 3D. So what they did here was that they made a large portion of the zombie horde 2D textures, or cardboards as they like to call them. And in fact, there are so many zombies on this screen right now that there is only roughly five real zombies that are fully modeled. 
which is not entirely surprising when you consider the fact that I believe this is the most amount of zombies ever depicted in season one. And at the end of the episode, you get a glimpse of the city. So I figured we could take the camera over here because as you know, when you look at this environment in game, it does look very, very vast and dense. However, moving the camera's position, different story. You are gonna find a couple of unique buildings here and it only serves to show you more detail than you never would be able to see by taking the camera up close to it. All right, now for episode four, there's something really interesting here with the grave site for the family dog. Now, after Lee digs up the grave, you can see the dog in the grave hole, and that's what this object is over here. But you might notice something a little bit strange about this dig site, and that there seems to be a much larger hole right underneath him. And the reason for this is because originally, the hole for which the dog was supposed to be in was going to be this deep. But then afterwards, it made more sense to have the dog further up on the grave. And that's why all the dirt is patched in over this hole, so the players can't see this relic of a mistake. Here's a zoom out of the house that you stay in most of the time. Again, one of the cool things about doing zoom outs of indoor scenes, especially in The Walking Dead is how fully realized it is on the inside and how that looks versus the outside which no care or attention was ever put forward on to make it look like there's an exterior to the house as they shouldn't as that would be a waste of time but combine that with a neighborhood skybox as well I it's kind of interesting to look at and in that one scene in episode 4 when the stranger is spying on Lee he runs up very quickly and you'll get a good chance to see him but if you were to stop the game footage and take a look right up to his face you can see that the character model for stranger was made ahead of time before episode 5. And oh boy, is there something really strange going on here. So this is a scene where Lee loads in a tape of a medical room, and when he plays the tape, it just starts showing you footage of what was happening prior in the same room. The lighting and characters are completely different, and so I wanted to show you what it looked like when it transitioned from the scene in which Lee is putting in the tape versus how it looks when the tape is playing. You may be surprised to find out that it's all in-game and instantaneous. Although this isn't hidden out of bounds, it's something that you may not have realized in plain sight. On these locker doors are a series of names and you might recognize two of them well at least i do one is one that you should recognize which is ryan benno here's his last name here on the second one from the left and next to him is another person that i also spoke to before completing this episode which is langley also known as andrew langley and he was one of the designers for the game but to go back to one of the surveillance footage scenes there was this one part in particular that was kind of funny to me where the doctor throws his hand in front of the camera lens and i wanted to see what that looked like from another angle so here's two angles in which the character model swaps from one position to another to pull that off. All right, here we go. The mystery of the floating cube. Now, I asked multiple people who worked on this specific episode of Walking Dead, and none of them had a great answer. All of them at best could give you a speculation as to what it could be. For example, here is a snippet of my conversation with Andrew Langley, and he was the one who directed me over to Nick. So <laughs> let's start off with the explanation from Ryan Benno, the environment artist, and then pass it over to Nick. The cube? I don't know what the cube would be. I don't know what the cube would be. Typically, in other game engines, you might see a cube that might mean that a particular model isn't loading properly, a part of a 3D bone that's showing up for some reason. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what that would be. There's no other reason why you, we would have a cube like that in there. Um, we never use primitives for anything except for World Geo. The Telltale tool didn't have, or it wasn't a primary function, to have cubes and to be able to create primitives. Um, that was only ever done in Maya and then imported into the tool. So yeah, these basic primitive objects uh, at Telltale were used just to block out environments early on in the process. An environment artist would sit down with the director and they'd sort of block it out together sort of really loosely. And this would allow us to get in there, move some cameras around, move some characters around, uh, get a feel for if the space is gonna work. And once we kind of lock that down, we can pass that off to animators and have people start shooting really rough choreography and uh, cinematics. So I imagine that as the environment artist went through and to uh, put in the actual geometry and with, you know, with textures and everything, this is something that just got missed. So episode five of Walking Dead doesn't do a previously on. Instead, it shows various scenes before it sets up for when you finally take control of Lee again. And this leaves us with an interesting effect, something that you don't see in any of the other episodes. Despite the fact that they have a previously on or next time on Walking Dead, 
They often don't share those scenes with the environment that you're going to be in or previously in. But as you're already starting to see here, I actually stopped the footage in the neighborhood, which is the furthest away from everything else. It was deep into the void, far down below both the other sets, as well as the main set in which you get to control Lee again. And as we're starting to make our way back up, you can then find the cityscape, which was also used as a scene. And then as a stroke of luck, I turned the camera around and then I found the scene with the train. And as you're gonna see over here, the train is not fully modeled. And actually it looks like the same train model used for the episode selector, which I'm not surprised by. In fact, what I'm most surprised about is how all these environments can exist together and not slow down the game but anyways then we make our way all the way back over here and then you can see it this is the starting area of episode 5 and like I said I stopped the footage before you got to see Lee and the gang so when you take the camera inside the building you'll see that none of the characters have any lighting on them and then if we turn back on the game footage albeit in fast motion you can see some of the zombies that are supposed to be on the outside of those windows and then here's a scene where Lee has to hold up a hallway and shoot down zombies as they start coming towards you funny enough if you remove the camera around the corner you can see that all the zombies get loaded into the same position, and before it's their turn to start moving in through the hallway, they're all locked into a T position. And once again, I know a lot of people want to know what happened with Kenny once he falls down through the roof. Unfortunately, after a certain cutaway to another scene, the character model just outright disappears. I looked all over the map, including, of course, inside of this room that you don't get a good look at, but I'm giving you a good look of it right now. He's simply nowhere to be found. And then towards the very end of the game, there is this room here. Now, you never get to open the door. In fact, if you try to do it when Clementine is around, she'll tell you... There's nothing in there. Can we go? And so if there was anything that I learned from this episode is that minimalism is key. If there is not an area that needs to be used, there usually is not something modeled for it. However, this one room has an empty space that looks like there used to be a room here. There's just no furniture or anything of the sort. Thankfully, the person who worked on this room happened to be Ryan Benno himself. So I asked him, why exactly is there this room here? One of the reasons why I built it out on this little sides here was that I wanted to give the cinematic artists the ability to put their camera kind of wherever they wanted to. You know, we might build an environment to a specific camera view that cinematic artist has for a little while. They might change that at some point, you know, that definitely happened uh, during the sewer scene in episode four. I kind of built out all these vines on a corner when Lee is down. Like once he initially descends down into the sewers, I'd kind of built this corner out with all these vines and spent a good amount of time on it, thinking that was where the camera was going to be. And then turned out they ended up swapping where the camera position was and all that work <laughs> you couldn't really see in the final game. And of course, a lot of you also wanted to see scenes like this one here where there's a large mob of zombies and get an idea of how it looks from another angle. Well, no surprise, once there's a lot of zombies on the screen, there need to be some resource management. And so in the back, we just have some silhouette cardboards of various zombies in the back with the zombies that are closer to the foreground being fully modeled. Now for this scene, don't make any mistake. I think we all know what actually happened here, but a lot of us need that closure and see it for ourselves. What exactly happens when Clementine pulls the trigger? And again, I have to stress the fact that this is of course non-canonical, but from another angle, you can see that Lee is still breathing after the gunshot, as well as no additional blood given to the character like there was for Duck. And also when the credits start rolling, Lee's eyes open up for some reason. It must have been an animation reset or something. I don't think it was intentional by any means. And we have this one last scene here with Clementine. After the credits, she ends up in a field and you see two silhouettes walking far off into the distance. And of course, I wanted to show you who these character models belong to. And when you get really close, you can see that the character models are completely blacked out, but it becomes very apparent for the silhouettes who they are. They're in fact just a couple of zombies. You can make this assessment through their mouths being gaping wide open but also the zombie leading the pack here has an exposed bone on his left arm which I think just sells it completely and while I'm doing a zoom out of various areas I just wanted to thank both Ryan Benno and I also want to thank Nick Herman for doing the surprise guest spot I learned so much about this game and how its development kind of worked out through talking to a lot of them and it was an absolute treat but anyways, as it is tradition around here, whenever I have a guest developer on the show, I leave the floor to them to speak to the fans. And again, I thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll leave a playlist on the screen here while I leave it to Ryan. Thank you so much. And Ryan, take it away. You know, it was really an honor and a privilege to be able to work on a game like this. Uh, the reception to the game, it's, it's very rare you ever see uh, your game be 
that well received but also seeing it kind of build up over time i think it was a very rare instance where you had you know because the game was releasing in episodic chunks you started to see people over the course of the year kind of really build on the game and go oh yeah i really like this and just enjoy each new bit and so that was it's very unique experience to see uh in this industry when you so often see you know now like you might get updates here and there but when you typically do story games right you kind of release one large thing and you're kind of done with it for the most part and so you know uh i would just like to say thanks to all the fans over the years that really enjoyed our game um you know i'm I played an incredibly small role in in the overall making of it, um, but we had an incredible team back in 2011 and 2012 making this game. And, uh, you know, the, the last little bit I would just leave everybody off with is, you know, if you really enjoy games, um, you know, the best thing that you can do is just support the people that make them, right? Your favorite games are all made by fans of other games that got into this industry and just want to make stuff that also inspires people so you know uh next time you play a game realize that there's usually a large group of people behind it who who have to build it mm -hmm.